Luke 5, 37 through 39 says, And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. For the new wine would burst the wineskins, spill on the wine and ruin the skins. New wine must be stored in new wineskins. But no one who drinks the old wine seems to want new wine. The old wine is just fine, they say. Amen. Thank you, uh, Donald. Thank you, praise team. Good morning, Northside. Great to see all of you here. I want to just begin here this morning with uh, an opening word of prayer. Just to, just want to pause to pray for us. Um, there are several requests that we have that uh, I want to ask you to pray for. Um, Orvin maybe uh, lost a cousin. Is that right, Mary? Was it his cousin um, a week ago? And so we want to pray for uh, uh, Kathy and Orvin and uh, their family. Uh, Larry and Vicki continue to recover, did get to go home, um, so we just continue to pray for their healing from COVID. It's great to see Pete here again, too, as well, and uh, we're lifting him up, praying for him. The Hollises, wanted to just mention uh, John's brother-in-law had passed away uh, a little over a week ago, and they've uh, been over in Illinois with the family, but we want to pray for them, too, as well. Uh, some of you may have heard uh, our brother Steve Miller suffered a small stroke this past Thursday, and he is home and hopefully recovering and uh, doing well, but we want to pray for Steve Miller and lift up his family. I would also ask that you pray for uh, the Ossian Church of the Nazarene as they lost one of their associate pastors this week to a stroke, um, passed away, and we want to just pray for them. And uh, his name was Steve Jones. We want to pray for the Jones family. Um, and then finally, um, this morning, it is our dear brother Joe Vermilen's last Sunday with us. And uh, Joe, I, some of you know Joe, some of you don't. He's in the sound booth, but Joe, stand up and just kind of wave at everybody. It's your last Sunday, so you, you can't be embarrassed anymore, but uh, Joe, uh, Joe's taking a job down in Arkansas, and he's going to be moving down there. Yeah, there are some, uh, some of you from the South, very excited about that, but uh, we just want to pray for Joe. It's been wonderful having him a part of this body, but praying he can find a wonderful church down in Arkansas to be a part of too as well. So um, I just want to open us in prayer, just spend a few minutes calling upon the Lord. I, I want to encourage you to take whatever prayer posture is comfortable for you. If you want to come and kneel at these altars, it's a great place to pray. If you want to turn and kneel in your seat, you're welcome to do that. If you want to stand, you're welcome to do that. But take whatever posture is comfortable for you. And I want to spend some time praying for us this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for this new day that you've given us. Thank you for Sunday morning. Thank you for this opportunity that we have as believers in you to gather together, to encourage one another, to sing these songs that just proclaim who you are and your love for us, to hear the word of God. We're so thankful for this place and this space that we have here at Northside. Father, we bring to you our request. Many in our body uh, just have not been feeling well, whether it be COVID, a cold, the flu, aches and pains. We just lift all of those individuals up to you. We pray for the continued healing of our brother and sister, Larry and Vicki. We pray for Pete's continued healing as well. Would you just be with them and remind them of your love for them? Remind them of the church that they are part of that loves them too as well. Lord, we pray for the Hollises and we just lift them up and pray that things went well with the service and with the family gathering together and just comfort them right now. Be their shepherd in this time of grief and loss and help them through this. Father, we, uh, we, we, we thank you for watching over Steve this week and allowing him to get to the hospital and to get checked out. We just pray for a continued healing from this stroke for Steve. We pray for strength for Carolyn as she takes care of him and encourages him. Just, uh, we lift up the Millers to you right now and just place them in your hand. Father, we pray for the Ossian Church of the Nazarene and the passing of Steve Jones. We pray for his family and for the church family too as well that you would bring comfort to them right now in their time of need. Bring strength. Bring that peace of mind that only you give. 
Father, we are so thankful to have had our brother Joe with us this past year, his presence here, his involvement in wanting to serve here at Northside, and just ask that you be with him as he makes this move to Arkansas, that you uh, protect him as he travels, and Lord, lead him to the, the right place to, to live and to be, and the right church to be a part of. We just pray your guidance, your continued guidance in Joe's life. And I thank you for the impact he's had on this body and the impact that this body has had on him. Would he continue to see your spirit at work? Father, thank you for an opportunity to talk about your word together, to think about the ways in which Jesus has an impact on our lives through the stories, through the parables, through his teaching, through the gospels. May we hear clearly your voice speaking to us this morning. I thank you for each and every person that's here. I thank you for each and every person that is tuning in online. Lord, will we just have an awareness that we are a part of something bigger than ourselves. We are a part of the church. We are a part of your body. We are loved by you. You've given us a purpose. And when we live into that, bless us. Bless our time together. Help us to see the ways that you've already blessed us. And it's in your name that we pray this. Amen. Amen. Well, church, we are starting a series. We've kicked off a series started last week called More About Jesus. And in this series, um, Jeff, if you'll help me here with the next slide. There we go. We're learning some things, and we're learning about who Jesus is from his own perspective, the things that Jesus taught, the things that Jesus said, the things that he, he lived. We're learning about who he is from his own perspective. We're also learning more about Jesus from the perspective of others, those that heard his words, that were challenged by his words, that were cut to the heart. We're also learning about Jesus from our gospel writer, Luke, the doctor. And then finally, we're learning more about Jesus' impact on our own lives, how He affects us, how He changes us. Last week, I introduced this to you. I want to mention it again, keep it before you, but we're taking a word and going to kind of allow it to hover over us throughout 2022, and that word is initiate. That word means to cause an action or a process to begin. I'm curious how God might be speaking to us through this word. What might God be initiating in us? What might He be asking us to initiate? What might He be asking us to be aware of that is something that reveals the truth about Him and being the great initiator? So we're going to see some examples of this, talk about this in our passage here this morning, but... The word is initiate. Everybody say that with me. Can you say it with me? Initiate. Initiate. Let's allow God to speak to us through that word. Well, I'm going to put our passage up on the screen. It's a short passage, so we can all look at this. I want to read it to you one more time. It's in Luke chapter 5. If you want to follow along in your own Bibles, Luke chapter 5. And this is the New Living Translation, and this is what the Word of God says. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. For the new wine would burst the wineskins, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. New wine must be stored in new wineskins. But no one who drinks the old wine seems to want the new wine. The old is just fine, they say. Well, today we're going to learn more about Jesus through this simple parable that he tells us here in the Gospel of Luke chapter 5. How many of you by show of hands have been reading the Northside Weekly? We put out a weekly reading plan. You can find it in the bulletin. It's on our Facebook page. And we offer scriptures to be read each week. And then the sermon on Sunday is drawn from those scriptures, connects to those scriptures. Well, one of the other passages that we had with this passage this week was a story in John chapter 2. It's the story of Jesus' first miracle. Jesus' first miracle. Jesus attends a wedding with his family. And while he's there at the wedding, I want to just tell you what happens in John chapter 2. While he's there at the wedding, word starts to get around. Gossip starts to swirl. 
people start to whisper that, uh uh-oh, the family has run out of wine. Now, maybe we're thinking if we were in that situation, well, why didn't they just go to Meyer and pick up some? Why didn't they just hit the party store and load up? Why didn't they just send their son or their daughter to do it? Well, it wasn't that easy 2,000 years ago. And to run out of wine was a huge social faux pas. So big that you would carry it with you for the rest of your life. You would be known in that town as the family who ran out of wine. It'd be pretty embarrassing. It may not embarrass you. Hopefully you Nazarenes. It doesn't embarrass us at all, does it? But a first century family hosting a wedding, having everybody there and running out of wine is a disaster. It's going to ruin their family. So luckily for the family, Jesus' mom, Mary, gets word of what's going on. And so Jesus' mom, Mary, goes to her son, Jesus, who at the time is about 30-some years old, and she says, hey, Jesus, they're about to run out of wine. And Jesus, you got to love the dynamics of the relationship between Mary and Jesus. That'll be some interesting stories to to hear and to talk to them in eternity, won't it? Jesus says, Mom, it's not my time yet. So like a good mother, Mary says, hey, servants, do whatever he tells you. He's going to take care of it. Which is exactly what Jesus does. There are six stones water, six stone water jugs somewhere in a back room filled with water. Jesus, his first miracle, changes water into wine. Saves the day. And not just, you know, the cheap wine, but the really good stuff. The master of the banquet tastes the wine and says, Wow. Holy cow, this is, the, this is really good. And then he throws out that normally you bring, you, 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 I don't remember how it goes, but normally the good stuff's out first and then as people get drunk, you, you bring out the watered down stuff and keep them going, but you have saved the best until last. I mean, I just think about what that did for that family. They were on the brink of disaster. They were on the brink of being social outcasts, of having to hang their heads everywhere they went. But when Jesus stepped in, when Jesus got involved, it completely flipped things upside down and they became known as the family who has the best wine in town. Man, that's what Jesus can do for you. That is how Jesus can bless you. That is how Jesus can change your life. He he has a way of giving to us Way more than what we deserve or what we expect. How many of you have experienced that in your life? I've experienced that time and time and time and time again. He loves to bless us. So when we come back to our parable, Jesus, he must have liked wine because he's talking about it again. He's talking about this parable about new wine put into new wine skins. So what Jesus is talking about here, just on the surface level, is wine, new wine when it's made, and when it's poured into, in this case, an animal skin, it'd be a goat skin, it'd be a sheep skin, some kind of leather pouch, and when it's poured into that leather pouch, as it starts to ferment, chemicals are released. One molecule goes to being two molecules. So when that happens, what happens to that skin, church? It starts to stretch, it starts to expand, And so you need new wineskins for new wine so that it can grow with it. Jesus makes the point that you don't take new wine and pour it into an old wineskin because that old wineskin's already been stretched out. And if you do that, the wine will start to ferment in there, start to stretch and expand, and then it'll bust that old wineskin and there'll be wine all over the place. Now we know, we know that this parable is not just basic how to take care of your wine, right? There's something deeper here Jesus is trying to get at. Jesus, listen to this church, Jesus is initiating something new. There's our word. Jesus is initiating something new. He is starting a revolution. And in order for us to be able to receive what it is that He has to offer, 
we've got to be willing to brace yourself, hold on, put the seatbelt on. We've got to be willing to change, to become a new wineskin. So as I'm reading this parable and thinking about this parable, I wonder what is it that the new what is this new wine that Jesus offers? What does he mean by that? How do we see that play out in his life? And why do we have to become new wineskins to receive this new wine? Well, if we step back, if we back the microscope up a little bit and get a bigger picture, I believe that we can look at and we can see the new wine that Jesus brings. In his preaching book but in his preaching book, Telling the Truth, Frederick Buchner says that when it comes to Jesus' methods, the ways that he taught, which this is one of the ways that Jesus brings new wine, he says that Jesus suggests rather than spells out. He evokes rather than explains. He's sometimes cryptic, sometimes obscure. He's sometimes irreverent. He's always provocative. He tells stories. He speaks in parables. I want to talk about some of those things with you because I believe this is one of the ways that we see the new wine that Jesus brings. It's in his methods. It's in how he teaches, how he communicates. So let's take those first two, for example. The idea that Jesus suggests rather than spells out, that he evokes rather than explains. I don't know about you, but when somebody, and I'm listening, listening to somebody talk, I'm kind of trained that I want there to be an introduction, I want there to be the main points, maybe numbered out one, two, and three, and then a conclusion, and goodbye, we're done. How many of you are trained like that? How many of you like something like that? You like your preacher to give a three-point sermon. My sermons are pointless. <laughs> I'm working on that, but they're pointless. Well, Jesus also had some pretty pointless messages too. I mean, think about some of the ways Jesus communicates. And if you want to look at some of these in your Bible, you're welcome to. But there's a story that Jesus tells a large crowd that's following him. And he doesn't preface the story with, okay, everybody sit down, get a piece of paper, get a pen. And number one, two, three, I've got three points, four points here in this one that I want to tell you. He doesn't do that. The crowd's following him. He turns around and he says, hey, Hey, I got something to tell you. The kingdom of God is like a farmer who goes out to sow in a field. He throws some of his seed out, some of it lands in rocky places where it can't get a root and so it dies. Some of it lands on a path. Birds fly in and they eat the seed. Some of it lands with weeds and it tries to grow, but it's choked out by the weeds. And some of that seed falls on the good soil and it produces a crop, a big, big crop. End of message, you're done, dismissed. Go have a wonderful Sunday afternoon. That's where Jesus leaves it with the crowd. So a little later on, thank goodness for the disciples. Don't you love the disciples, the curious disciples? Because one of those disciples says to Jesus, hey, tell us what that parable means. And Jesus unpacks that parable, that this is how people respond to the Word of God. But when He's telling that parable, it it suggests something. It evokes something in us. I think it stirs something in us to think, how do I respond and receive the kingdom of God? It's not Jesus telling, hey, you over there, you in the back, this this is the kind of soil you are. No, it's Jesus putting it all out there and allowing this message to speak and meet the people right where they are at. That's the genius of Jesus. He's the best teacher ever. He's the most genius teacher ever. He knew exactly what he was doing. He suggests rather than spells out. He evokes rather than explains, and that causes thinking and stirs some things. Sometimes Jesus is also cryptic and obscure. That's kind of annoying as a preacher. Because we want to be able to tell you, I want to be able to give you the three points and tell you exactly what Jesus meant. But sometimes things are a little bit harder. You really have to dig at it. And there might be somebody else that comes along that says, no, this is what I think that that means. There's an example of this in the Gospel of John where Jesus Jesus is telling uh, some religious leaders, speaking to some religious leaders, and he says, if you destroy this temple... I will rebuild it in three days. And he's there at the temple in Jerusalem. So where would your mind naturally go when you hear this? 
It would go exactly where the, the crowd's mind went to. What? I mean, somebody even mentions that it took a month and a half to build this temple, and you're going to build it in three days? Yeah, right. But what we learn in that is that Jesus wasn't talking about a physical building when he said that. It was cryptic. He was talking about himself. He was talking about his death on the cross and then his resurrection that took place three days later. He's sometimes cryptic. He's sometimes obscure. You know, here's another one. Jesus is sometimes seen as irreverent. Even in our passage of Scripture, the context for where we're at, some religious leaders go to Jesus and they point out and they say to Him, hey, the Pharisees' disciples spend time praying and fasting. John's disciples, John the Baptist, his disciples spend time praying and fasting. So Jesus, why is it that your disciples spend time eating and drinking? There's something there about that, that Jesus is not following what everyone thinks he should follow, that Jesus' disciples are not doing what they should do. It's kind of, kind of humorous in some ways that the very one that they're speaking to, the very one that they might see as irre irreverent is the very one that gave us the Word of God. Is the Word of God in the flesh? There's another story where Jesus' mom and brothers come to get him. And the crowd knows that they're there. It's over in Luke chapter 8, knows that they're there. And they tell him, Jesus, mom's here. Mary's here. She wants you. And Jesus, you know what he says to that? He says, my mother and my brothers are all those who hear God's word and obey it. And Jesus took a right hand across the cheek from his mom on that one, I bet. <laughs> no, I don't think she did that. But I, could you imagine what that felt like, though, to his mom? For him to say, basically, no, my real, mom, my real family are those that hear my words and obey it. It's like, almost like Jesus is disregarding the commandment about honoring thy father and thy mother. Jesus allows his disciples on a Sabbath to eat grain. He's seen as irreverent, as breaking a commandment. You know what else Jesus does on the Sabbath that's seen as irreverent? He heals people. He heals people. And that's seen as, well, you're breaking the law. You're not supposed to do that. Jesus is always provocative too as well. When he speaks, there's something that sometimes pokes at us. Sometimes it's something that gets stirred in us. I think of his first sermon. Jesus' first sermon, it was a doozy. It brings me a lot of comfort as a pastor when I think about my first sermon to go and to read about Jesus' first sermon. When he was done nearing the point where he was finishing his sermon, he told a story that involved the healing of a Gentile, specifically one by the name of Naaman the Syrian. Naaman the Syrian was pretty ferocious. He was not, he's not somebody that Jesus' family and friends were holding up as an example of faith, yet Jesus holds Naaman the Syrian up as an example of faith and why God moved and who God healed. Well, the response of the crowd on Jesus' first sermon, you know what they did? I don't know how they got him there. They might have picked him up. Somebody might have thrown him over their shoulder. But they got him. And the scriptures tell us the entire crowd marched out of the synagogue to a giant cliff with the intention of throwing Jesus off the cliff and killing him. You talk about an altar call. My goodness. And Jesus is able to slip away. He was provocative. 
Jesus told stories. He told parables. Some of the stories that Jesus told, they're familiar to, to everyone. Sometimes even those that don't know uh, Jesus as Savior, those that aren't familiar with the Christian faith, have heard the story of the prodigal son. How many of you have heard the story of the prodigal son? A son that squanders all of his wealth, leaves, has a change of mind, decides that he would be better if he went back home and was just a servant on his father's property. But once he gets there, he sees that his dad is actually waiting for him. And his dad runs out to greet him and welcomes him back, not as a servant, but as a son, a loved son. It's a shocking story. There's the story of the Good Samaritan. I mean, there are some great stories that Jesus told, great parables that Jesus told. But how Jesus taught his methods of teaching is some of the new wine that Jesus brings to the table. Are you a new wineskin? Another new wine that Jesus brings to the table is how he lives his life. Okay, so we talked about his methods, how he taught. Now we're going to talk about how he actually lives his life. Some of the things that he does are extremely out of the ordinary, maybe even a little bit weird. But one of the things Jesus does is that he heals a leper by touching the leper. You didn't do that in his day. If you had leprosy, if you were diagnosed with leprosy, you were supposed to cover up, put on the coats, put on the blankets, go to the outskirts of town and make sure when anybody's around that you holler out, I have leprosy. That's a warning that nobody will come near you, that nobody will touch you. But what does Jesus do to a leper? He walks up, he reaches out and he touches the leper and the leper is cleansed. The leper is healed. That's the new wine that Jesus brings. You know what else Jesus does? How he lives his life? He walks around telling people they're forgiven of their sins. I think about the crippled man that was lowered down through a ceiling by his friends right in front of Jesus as he was teaching. And you know what Jesus said to that crippled man? He said, son, your sins are forgiven powerful statement the religious leaders they weren't going around telling people that your sins are forgiven they were pointing people to God to, and saying find forgiveness with God but Jesus Jesus is speaking to people and he's saying your sins are forgiven I think about the woman who anointed Jesus with the perfume Jesus said your sins are forgiven that's the new wine that Jesus brings Jesus also addresses God as Father. He does this a lot. He speaks of God a lot as His Father. He even gives us a prayer in which we start with the words, what is it, church? Our Father. That's some of the new wine that Jesus brings and how He lives His life. He also makes the kingdom of God available to all. We hear this in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 where he says, Blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. To be blessed means you have God's favor. It means that God is present with you. Normally, the people that Jesus names off as being blessed by God, being favored by God, are not normally people that we would look at and say that are blessed or favored by God. But Jesus turns things on its head. He turns this on its head. He makes the kingdom of God available to all. He announced his sermon was that the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. He didn't say that this was only for a certain age. This was only for a certain gender. He, he didn't say this was only for his people. It was available to everyone. And he made sure that he let people know that. Jesus also hangs out, spends time with, shares a meal with tax collectors and sinners. He even gets the nickname. He tells us this in Luke chapter 7, verse 34, that he's called the friend of sinners. Just by show of hand, and if, just by show of hand, how many of you know some sinners? All right, everybody knows some sinners? Yeah, okay, yeah, some of we, yeah, go to church with them, yep. 
Don't look at the person when you say that, but uh, yeah. Okay, so here's a question for you. Here's something that I've been thinking about. If Jesus was known as a friend of sinners, how about you? Do the sinners that you know look at you as a friend? And if you're wondering, well, what does that mean? I mean, what's, what's friendship? Well, I've heard it put in the context of Jesus being labeled a friend of sinners, that a friend of sinners, if you truly are friends with sinners, that they will actually introduce you to their friends who are sinners. That, that's a level of true friendship with sinners, that they're willing to actually introduce you to their friends who are sinners. Levi did that. Or, or Matthew, the tax collector. When Jesus invited him to follow him, you know what Levi did? You know what Matthew did? Luke's very careful to tell us in the text in chapter 5 that Levi, he, he invites his tax collector friends and guests to join him at his house so that he can introduce Jesus to them. Now Luke, as he's writing this story, he, he does something here. He changes some of the language around as we get down further into the story. And the Pharisees and the religious leaders that show up, they, they ask the question, why do you eat with tax collectors and not guests? They change the word guest to what? Sinners. Why do you eat with tax collectors and sinners? What are you doing, Jesus? And then he reminds us it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but it's the sick. Jesus was seen as a friend to sinners. How about you? Do you have any sinners that would call you their friend? It's really easy to, once we make that decision to follow Jesus, to bubble ourselves in, shield ourselves, and maybe there, maybe there are certain people, friends, that we might need to do that from, but we don't want to lose that connection with those that haven't made a decision to believe and follow Jesus. We want to keep a, a point of contact. We want to keep a connection with those that don't know Christ. Jesus, he ate with tax collectors and sinners. Something else that Jesus did and how he lived his life that was, I would consider to be new wine was that he lived his life with margins. He lived his life with margins. What do I mean by that? I mean that Jesus didn't schedule every single minute of every single day. He had off time. He had downtime. He had sporadic time. He was flexible. And because he was flexible, because he lived with margins, he changed lives. Because it allowed him to take time to be with people, to interact with people, to have a conversation with someone. I mean, some of the great conversations we have recorded in Scripture are things that Jesus didn't plan happening. They just sort of happened. I think about Nicodemus, the religious leader of Jerusalem. What did he do? He came to Jesus one night to ask him questions, and there was a great conversation that ensued. I think about the woman at the well. As Jesus' disciples are running in town to get Chick-fil-A, Jesus is hanging out there at the well and he strikes up this conversation with this woman that I believe changed her life. I think about Jesus as he was marching into a town one day and the crowd was pretty excited just to see him. They wanted to see what he looked like. Who is this guy? And as he's marching into town, walking into town, all of a sudden under a tree, Jesus stops. Maybe the disciples thought, oh, he's, he needs some shade. We do, he doesn't want to get sunburned. But instead, Jesus looks up into that tree. He sees a guy, and he says, hey, Zacchaeus, what's up? Hey, why don't you come down because I'd like to share a meal with you today. I don't think Jesus 
had that on his agenda when he started his ministry. It just sort of happened because Jesus lived with margins in his life. And those margins opened up the possibility for great spiritual conversations. I tell you, we are a people here in America that struggle with living with margins in our life. We struggle with it with our time. We struggle with it with our money. How many of you live with margins in your money? How many of you each week have extra money? How many of you have the ability to give to someone that's in need? Do we live with margins in our lives? Jesus did. I'm, I've been challenged with that. I've been challenged by Jesus to try and, try and not, sometimes it's, it's, it's hard to do, but try and have some openness to my schedule for what might happen, who I might encounter. You see, the way Jesus lived his life is new wine. In order to get it, we're going to have to become like new wineskins. Finally, one more new wine aspect of Jesus is the content that Jesus taught. So we've talked about his methods being new wine, the ways that he taught, the ways that he lived his life being new wine. Now I want to talk about the content and what Jesus spoke, what he was saying, what he was teaching, and what he was preaching. You see, Jesus in his first sermon says that the kingdom, God's reign and rule, it's available to everyone if you repent. If you repent, if you turn from how you're living now, do a 180 and seek to hear and obey what He has to say. In John 3.16, you've heard the verse before, some of you. It's a very familiar, familiar verse. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. I mean, that's some of the content that Jesus brings. And if you want to be a part of what He's doing, if you want to be a part of the revolution that He's initiating, it's simply a matter of belief. Simply a matter of having a change in your mind that God maybe is seen as this distant grandpa in a rocking chair to God is right here in the flesh in front of me. You know, the surprising thing about Jesus and what he teaches, it's maybe not what those around him expected. And sometimes we hear this in some of the conversations that Jesus has with his disciples. They seem to have their mind focused on some of the political things that are going on in their day. One of the big things being that the Jews were overseen by those dirty, nasty Romans. They should not have their fingers. They should not be involved in our land, Jesus. Surely you're going to rise to your throne and destroy them and kick them out. But Jesus didn't bring that kind of revolution, did he? Jesus didn't seem to be too concerned with the hot-button topics of his day. He was more concerned with the hot-button topics of the heart. He was more concerned not with a transformation of the political system around him, but a transformation of every single person's heart and mind as they sought to follow him and live like him. And he presented more than, uh, more than one occasion that sin, sin, sin is something that comes from within, something we have to deal with, something that we have to crucify. He also tells us in John chapter 7, this is a great verse worth looking at. If you'll turn there with me, John chapter 7. This is related to the content that Jesus brings, that he teaches, that's new wine. John chapter 7, verse 37 And it says that Jesus shares, he shouts this to the crowd. He says, anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart. You see, Jesus, his content It's about a transformation of the people that would turn to him and that would follow him. He's about turning us into new creations. I've been turned and changed into a new creation and God continues to work on me to this day. 
That's what Jesus brings that's different. That's what Jesus brings that's new wine is he wants to build and do a transformation deep within you. He doesn't want to just say, hey, you are forgiven for the acts of sin. He also wants to remove the roots that cause you to sin. And he gives us an invite to come to him, to drink from him. And when we do, when we do, the spirit will be unleashed in us. And true life, eternal life, will be birthed in us. How about you? Are you ready to receive Him? Have you made a decision to believe in Him, to trust in Him? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to bow your heads with me. If you've not made that decision to believe in Jesus, to follow Him, I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. Because it makes a huge difference in how we live, how we parent, how we grandparent, how we neighbor, how we work. And so I want to give you an opportunity to believe in Him. Here's what I want you to do. I'm going to just say a a very simple prayer. And if you would like to make that decision to follow Christ, to receive Him into your life, I want to just invite you to pray this prayer with me. Here it is. Jesus, I turn from my sins. I turn to you. I receive you into my life. Amen. Amen. Head still bowed, eyes closed. Is there anyone here this morning that prayed that? That's an exciting thing. It makes me joyful to know. If that's you, would you just kind of raise your hand, okay? I want to just see. Awesome, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Okay, thank you. Welcome to the family. Welcome to, you can open your eyes again. Welcome to this journey that we call salvation. You have started, you have started something that is gonna be with you for the rest of your life. You have started this quest that we hold as a mission of, as our church to love Jesus and to love people. Welcome to the family of God. You see, that's something that Jesus teaches us that's new wine, that it doesn't matter where you come from, what your last name is, Jesus is going to give you a new family. He's going to give you a new last name. And we could find our identity in Christ. How many of you have found your identity in Christ? It's such a relieving feeling to know this is who I am. The old has been made new. I didn't share this with you last week, but last week we talked about when Jesus came up out of those waters of the Jordan River when he was baptized, and there was a voice that spoke to him, a voice that said, this is my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Do you know that if you are in Christ, that voice is speaking to you as well. That applies to you as well. You are God's child now. If you're in Christ, you are God's child. He loves you. He's pleased with you. So the new wine that Jesus brings, he did it in how he taught, the methods he used. He did it in how he lived his life. And he did it with the content of what he modeled, of what he taught, of what he spoke. The last line of our verse, our passage in Luke 5 is one that's interesting. Verse 39, Jesus says, but no one who drinks the old wine seems to want the new wine. The old is just fine, they say. I want to just talk about this for a moment because this is about us. This is about the response of the wineskin. Are we going to be the old wineskin that's trying to fit the new wine in or are we willing to make some changes to become that new wineskin that can grow and learn and be flexible with the new wine that Jesus offers us? Change can be tough. Change can be really tough. Think about how many New Year's resolutions have probably already died by this date. Anybody want to say, hey, yeah, I was going to do this and I just haven't got to it. Ah, I'll wait till 2023. You know, it's, 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 it's weird because we say we want changes, but then at the same time, we struggle in making those changes. Jesus knew that change would be tough. 
Jesus knew how resistant people were going to be to his ministry, how resistant people were going to be to the new wine that he had to offer. And if you have any doubts about that, I want you just to think of the symbol that Catholic churches, Protestant churches, Eastern Orthodox churches use as an emblem of their faith. What is it? If you need help, there's a gigantic one behind me. The cross. You know what happened on the cross? We tried to crucify the new wine. The problem is this new wine didn't sit real well on the tomb. It fermented, it grew, and it busted out of that tomb. That tomb wasn't very flexible, was it? Even today, even today, those of us who follow Christ, there could be the possibility that we become an old wineskin. There could be a possibility that we become resistant to what God might be doing in and around us. Some of us may live with a grip uh, on nostalgia and the hope that one day the good old days will come back. Sometimes as pastors and leaders in the church, we hear this in statements like, I wish I could bring, or I wish we as a church could bring back, fill in the blank. As if God only worked 30, 50 years ago and is not doing anything new now. But you know what we have to remember, church, is those good old days... Whatever God was doing in those good old days, it was new wine. It was new wine. Which meant that there were probably people looking around at some of the things happening 50 years ago in the church, and they couldn't believe it. They were upset. Take the altars, for example. If you're not sure what these are, I have a Christian that, uh, or not a Christian, a soon-to-be Christian um, that I'm working to be, build a friendship and a relationship with, and um, they refer to these things as the, the thingies that people come up and kneel at. The thingies that people come up and kneel at is something we call an altar. Can you all see this? It's wooden. Ours have the nice cushion there, so when you kneel, your knees have a place to, to be. Here's one over here too as well. You guys can all see this, right? It's an altar. We look at this as a tool, as a place where you can come and have an encounter with God. As a place where you can respond to maybe what God is doing in your life. A place where you can come and pray. I love the altars. It's what I've grown up with. Every youth retreat I went to, youth camp I went to, there were altars and there were altar calls and there was always a bunch of people at those altars crying. I remember about every Sunday when I was in junior high and into senior high that when an altar call was given, I was going down to pray. But the altars, do you know that the altars in the way that we use them, ways that most of us think about them, that a hundred years ago, because that's when they came into existence, this was new wine. This was new wine. I mean, some of the story going back to how the altars created started with Charles Finney and him having benches up front and having a service and saying, if you would like to pray or you feel God speaking to you, we invite you to come up and sit in these benches up here in the front. Could you imagine if you were a part of that and you're listening to that, could you imagine what you might be thinking or what some of the people might be thinking to this new wine that's being offered? What? I'm already seated here. Why would I get out of my seat here and move up closer to the front? Who does that? I mean, I got the back row seat. I don't want to be in the front. There was resistance to it. But then it was the holiness church, the Nazarene church, that really kind of perfected the use of the altar call. They used the altar as a way for people to receive Jesus. They wanted to give people an opportunity. There was a sense of urgency that if you would like to become a Christian now, stand and follow the sawdust trail down to the altar and meet Jesus. Now, you know what's really interesting about that is that, again, I mentioned to you that that was considered new wine. 
So if it was new wine, it would take new wine skins to get it, which would also mean there's probably some old wine skins that just don't get it. There were some Baptists at some of our Nazarene camp meetings, and they were really disturbed and upset when they saw Nazarene pastors telling people and inviting people to come down to the altar at the end of the service. They were so upset, so upset, the story goes, that they held their own camp meeting. I like to imagine that it was right across the street and they had signs, you know, competing, this is where Jesus is at. No, this is where Jesus is at. It probably wasn't right across the street, but they held their own camp meeting and the leaders in this church prayed for those Nazarene pastors that they would stop committing heresy and that God would smite That's right, smite these leaders in this holiness church all over the altar call. But the altar call, again, 100 years, it's 100 years old. When it came out, it was new wine. It was new wine because, now you might want to brace yourselves for this. Are you ready? Jesus did not use altars. You know, that seems like that would be a point where some of you might walk out on me. Jesus did not use altars. And think about this. Bro was a carpenter. Jesus could have built himself some sweet wooden altars, and he also had 12 disciples that each one of them could have hauled that altar. I mean, he could have said, hey, we're going up on the hill, Sermon of the Mount. Disciples, grab the 12 altars. He didn't use altars. This was new wine 100 years ago. Now, I have no problem with having an altar call. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I just think that we have to be thinking, church, what new things might God be doing today? There are churches that fight over the altars. There are statements that are sometimes made that a true Nazarene church has altars up front. I don't want us to fall into that trap, if you will. Because like Jesus said, the most important thing is to hear his word and obey it. And there might be some that hear his word saying, go to the altar and pray, obey it. There might also be others, there might be some coming generations that say, you know, we're more interested in how we actually live Monday to Saturday than just what we do in that one trip down to the altar on a Sunday morning. We see that living during the week is meaning a little bit more than coming to the altar. I'm not saying that's okay, I agree with that, I'm just saying that sometimes is some of the thinking of others. And are we willing, are we willing to look for what God is doing, look and see if there's possibly some new wine that's being offered, and are we willing to become a new wineskin? What new things might God be wanting to do in and around us today? What new things might God want to do with Northside? Now, if you're worried about me removing the altars, And some of you, you do have that worry. I I feel like you treat me like you showed up at 9 p.m. one night and you caught me trying to haul the altars to the dumpster. Um, I've never done that. I don't plan to do that. If you feel led to respond to the altar, I love it as a place to come and connect with God. I see it as a tool. But I also realize that not everyone's going to respond to an old-fashioned altar call. And that's okay. As long as we are responding to Jesus. This is just a, a means to an end, church. It's a means to an end. So I want to challenge you. I want to give an altar call. I want you this week to ask God what new thing that He might be doing around you and go and serve and get involved with it. What new thing is God doing in and around you? Maybe you already know what it is. Maybe you've already been made aware of it. Maybe you've already felt a leading towards something. Maybe that's what it is, but are you willing to take that initiative? Are you willing to initiate and go and move and take that step and do something about what God is calling and asking you to do? Remember what Jesus says there in Luke. Anyone who hears my word and obeys it is my family. 
Jesus also says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount that anyone who hears my words and puts it into practice is like a wise builder that built their house on a concrete foundation, not sand right next to the ocean. I'm trying to listen for the new ways God might be working in and around my, my context and the relationships that I have, our community. And I had a new wine moment this week. I didn't drink wine, just want to let you know that. I had a new wine moment where I felt like God's doing something. There's potential here. This could be something big. And I need to listen. I, I need to take action. I need to let God speak. I need to become a new wineskin. Michelle and I met with a, a pastor from Warsaw this past week. And this pastor has helped to bring his community of churches together to form this coalition of where they offer different sorts of ministries, different sorts of um, needs, me, need meters, I guess is be the word for that, or resources to foster families in the Warsaw area. And it was really an amazing thing because the churches that are on this list are churches that don't believe the same thing. Churches that, uh, theologically speaking, are, are, are not anywhere close to one another. But when it comes to doing what the Word of God says, they take James 1.27 pretty seriously. James 1.27, you remember that passage of Scripture? True religion is this, to take care of widows and orphans. And these churches in the Warsaw community, not all of the churches, some of them have said, no, if that church is a part of this, we are not going to be a part of it. That's their choice. But there's a good group of churches in the Warsaw area that are working together to minister and meet needs of foster families. And I tell you, I would love for the churches here in Elkhart to pile our resources together, pool our resources together, and work together in a spirit of unity to help foster families in our community. I think it would be awesome because there are things that Northside can offer to foster families, wonderful things that we can offer to foster families, but there's only certain things. And there are other things that other churches around us could offer to foster families. This is new wine being poured into new wineskins. I know that there will be some challenges to this because Northside and the culture here, it's very competitive, I'm finding out among pastors. There's kind of a fear that if we work together, my people may start going to your church and I'll lose them. And we've got to get over ourselves. We've got to be willing to set that be behind us for the sake of helping someone else, someone in need, ministering to someone, loving someone. See, that's what it means when we talk about love Jesus, love people. Sometimes those people might belong to the United Methodist Church down the road or the Baptist Church downtown. But it's about us working together. And I just imagine if the community of Elkhart could see the churches working together, what encouragement would that bring to the people that live here in Elkhart? That they see us as we're on a team. We're on the same team. Our final destination, we're going to end up in the same place. And God's not going to sort us out by denomination. Amen. New wine and a new wine skins. Man, Jesus, I tell you, he brings some incredible, incredible things. Are you ready to receive those? I am excited about what 2022 holds. I got to make sure I say that correctly. Not 2022, but 2022. I'm excited about what this year holds, what it has in store for us. There are good things to come. I have a great hope in God and I have a great hope that His Spirit has already began initiating some of this work around me. And I hope that you will feel the same way with wherever it is God is leading you, whatever new wine He might be offering you. I pray and hope that you will become like that new wine skin and receive what He's telling you. I've asked Pastor Dallas to come this morning, and he's going to pronounce a blessing over you. Pastor Dallas, Northside, if you'll stand.
Would you receive this benediction this morning? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face to you and give you peace. Would you go this day with that peace, being prepared to offer and receive new wine this week? God bless.